I'm of the firm belief that Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is the best Spider-Man movie we've ever gotten. I still remember going to see it in theaters and thinking it would just be some disposable kids movie. After all, Sony doing an animated Spider-Man movie? What a cash grab. Of course, I soon discovered that producers Phil Lord and Christopher Miller were in fact reinventing the superhero movie in animated form. In that film, I saw things that I never thought I'd see in a superhero film, and I believe its mingling of the Spider-Verses paved the way for perhaps the best live-action Spider-Man movie we've gotten, No Way Home. But how would a sequel fare? I've actually been seeing bits and pieces of this movie for years, with Sony having shown us extended looks at Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse at the various cinema cons I've attended. And even with rough animation, I have to say it looked pretty spectacular. But how is the finished film, beyond anything I could have hoped for? So in this one, it's about a year after becoming Spider-Man that Miles Morales, voiced again by Shemek Moore, is trying to juggle school, his home life, and being a superhero. His life gets even more complicated when Spider-Gwen, once again voiced by Haile Steinfeld, emerges into his universe to keep tabs on The Spot, voiced by Jason Schwartz. Sportsman, an enemy Miles already humiliated. To his horror, the one-time joke enemy becomes powerful enough to endanger the fabric of the multiverse, putting him on a collision course with the Spider Society, led by the tormented Miguel O'Hara, voiced by Oscar Isaac. So, Across the Spider-Verse, of course, is only half of the story here, with Beyond the Spider-Verse coming out next year. It's going to add up to a pretty lengthy epic, with this one running about 2 hours and 20 minutes, but boy, is it ever engrossing. It's in fact pretty spectacular. Just like its predecessor, it proves that animation really is the only limitation for these films, and Lord and Miller, with their three directors, Kemp Powers, Joaquim Dos Santos, and Justin K. Thompson, seem to have no lack of that. Like a lot of other superhero movies coming out this year, this explores the concept of the multiverse, but does so in ways a live-action film could never dream of. If the last one blew minds by having Spider-Ham and Spider-Man Noir, this one features endless variations on the character, including cat, dinosaur, and even Lego versions of Spider-Man, all of which you'll actually find yourself taking fairly seriously. Notably, it expands on the Sony and MCU shared Spider-Verse in interesting ways, teeing up limitless ways the franchise could continue. As part of an epic story, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is able to take its time bringing you back into its world. The first 20 minutes of the film actually spends a lot of time developing Spider-Gwen, who gets a fully fleshed out backstory that was only hinted at in the first film. When we do meet Miles again, the filmmakers give us plenty of time to explore his universe and basically hang out. Once again, we get to like Miles, and especially his parents, including his cop dad, Captain Davis, voiced by Brian Tyree Henry, and his mom, Rio, voiced by Luna Lauren Velez. The movie kicks into high gear in its second and third acts, which see Miles having a multiverse adventure that introduces us to an amazing collection of spider people, including Karen Sony's Spider-Man India and Daniel Kaluuya's scene-stealing Spider-Punk. Each character has their own style of animation, and the effect is trippy to say the least. It actually takes a little getting used to, as you're bombarded with stimuli, but the effect is intoxicating and unlike anything you've really seen before. Like the first film, it has plenty of humor, but also a heart-wrenching main story that involves Miles discovering his true place in the multiverse may not be what he thinks it's going to be. And in fact, some real pain is inevitable for him and his friends in order for him to continue on his journey. The voice cast is superb, with Shamaik Moore definitive as Miles Morales. If they do make a live-action Miles Morales movie, that's going to be hard to get anybody to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. And in fact, it's probably unnecessary. When you see this movie, you'll understand what I mean. Haile Steinfeld, of course, is excellent as Spider-Gwen, a protagonist in her own right. One thing I really appreciate about these movies is that despite the visual style, the voice actors always act naturalistically. They aren't doing big voices the way people often do when voicing cartoons. For an example of this... You need look no further than the Super Mario Brothers movie. Everybody's doing big, cartoony voices! They don't do that here. They underplay as needed, giving the film a truly human dimension. Oscar Isaac's Miguel O'Hara, aka Spider-Man 2099, and Jason Schwartzman's The Spot are two good examples of that. They add pathos to what in a simpler movie would have been pretty standard roles. It's a film jam-packed to the brim with breakout characters. In fact, pretty much everybody here could probably get their own spin-off movie and includes the welcome return of Jake Johnson as Peter B. Parker, Miles' mentor who expertly conveys how his once hopeless character has indeed become a better man and maybe even an optimist thanks to his positive influence of working with Miles. As far as describing characters go, I'm going to stop right there as the less you know about this Spider-Verse sequel, the better. Rest assured it's one heck of a ride with gorgeous visuals and an expertly crafted soundtrack that includes, for my money, the year's best score, so far anyway, by the great Daniel Pemberton. Indeed, between this and The Flash, superhero movies are on the verge of a major reinvention. It'll be interesting to see if the proper MCU can keep up 
as both these movies, which come out within mere weeks of each other, really change the game in a big way. I give this film a pretty superb 9 on 10. And you might be asking me, Chris, we loved it so much, why not give it a 10 on 10? My only caveat is that we haven't seen the second half of the movie yet, with Beyond the Spider-Verse not coming out until April. Taken together, we'll see if this truly is the masterpiece it seems to be. But until then, it's got to be a 9. That said, boy oh boy, are people going to love this movie.